Okay, good morning, everyone. Quite a lot of technology. I was looking just as we were getting ready. I think there were about four or five. Oh. <laughs> Clearly, I can't get too close to you, otherwise bad things will happen. Um, there are about four or five people all beavering away to try and get the technology set up so one person could talk, or two people. Um, so I'm really delighted to have uh, this opportunity to open this meeting. As Kelly alluded to, I am going to try and involve you. I am going to try and use technology to involve you uh, in the talk that I'm going to give today. Just before we get going, I was sort of prowling around at the back of the room, and the, the sight lines, this is a fabulous room, and, and please try hard not to get too distracted by the view. Um, the sight lines aren't great, and the screen is not huge. So particularly for the tables towards the back of the room, if any of you have laptops or tablets, you can get a copy of the talk at the link that <laughs> is probably too small for you to read, so <laughs> I will read it out. It's bit.ly forward slash Bates Talks, all one word. So if you are squinting and peering as we get into the, the slides, try and have a, uh, a look over your shoulder or to your neighbors to uh, see if someone has a local copy of the slides. And you know, if they have any problems getting logged on, then there's probably one or two people in the room who could help them out in, uh, in terms of accessing that. Uh, the second thing I, I, I just want to point out, I give you permission to become distracted for the next five minutes because if you have a device with you capable of accessing the internet, please log on to the Wi-Fi now because that's the way or one of the ways I'll be trying to engage you in, uh, in a conversation. Uh, so, you know, as educators and as teachers, it's normally terribly distracting to see people dive into their bags and dig out their phones and start tapping away. Uh, so for at least the, the next five minutes, you have my, uh, my permission to do so. OK, so um, I titled my talk, The Anatomy of a 21st Century Educator. What I want to think about for the next 50 minutes or so is what, in, in a landscape that we find ourselves in, in higher education, that's changing rapidly, all sorts of forces and drivers for change. Um, what are the skills, the habits, the values, the attitudes that educators in that environment need, not just to survive, not just to make it through, but actually to thrive uh, and to excel? And I'll, I'll, the, the talk's really two halves. I'll start with some thinking that the we've been doing on that topic, thinking about these skills and habits and values as body parts or uh, bits of the anatomy. Apologies to anyone with a health sciences background. I am going to torture the metaphor. Um, and then in the second half, I want to give you some examples based on um, my own work teaching, as Kelly said in the introduction, a, a large intro course at UBC. and. Um, essentially a similar course before I moved here three years ago uh, at the University of Edinburgh. So, um, and then Kelly's also, I did think about coming up and putting the slide up so that you wouldn't have to read out all the, uh, the high five items. I think what I'm going to say, at least I've tried to, to ensure that, that what I have to talk about touches on all of these themes in some way uh, and I think some of the issues that, that we'll get into will have implications for all five of those areas and probably quite a few others um, as well. So I said just a few moments ago that there's many drivers acting to change aspects of higher education. Um, and I want to just start by highlighting one. And unsurprisingly, the one that I've chose to focus on is technology. There are many others. We could think about the globalization of education, demands from 
learners, demands from funding sources, requirements of employers. Um, but let's just think about technology. I love this quote from Douglas Adams. Technology is stuff that doesn't work yet. Please cross what you have for the next, well, let's say two days, that that's, uh, that's not the case in this space. Um, so I want to give just three quick examples of the way technology is driving change. And, and you know, I have a sort of learning technology and an e-learning background, so it's kind of fascinated me for a long time because technology, you know, if you want to think about it simplistic, simplistically, is both part of the challenge, but it's also part of the solution as well. So it has this almost unique dual um, position. And I want to give you just three quick examples of how technology is driving change in terms of the pace and the scale at which this is happening, uh, the reach and the idea of unbundling the, the academic enterprise, uh, and then finally, you hear a lot about technology being a disruptive force. I want to highlight one particularly disruptive area uh, as an example. So um, the first of those, scale and pace of how technology is changing things. Next couple of slides. And if you have the slides, don't peek ahead. Right? You have to go at the same pace as me. And maybe I'll walk up the back just to make sure that people are playing nice. So I, I, I got these couple of slides from Eric Grimson, who's a professor of MIT, uh, a professor of computer science at MIT. He's also their chancellor for academic enhancement. And I think they really nicely illustrate the pace and scale of change. So what I hope you can see on this slide is a picture of when former Pope John Paul II's body was brought out for public viewing in 2005. Fast forward eight years to exactly the same place when Pope Francis makes his first public appearance. And that's a photo of probably not the same crowd, but the crowd, um, eight years on. And, you know, the difference is striking. You can just about, if you're close to the front, make out flip phones. Anyone remember flip phones? Flip phones were so cool when they were, uh, when they were the latest thing. But now, it's all smartphones and iPads. And I think sometimes working within this space you forget just how fast this is going. So scale and pace is rapid, fast, and some would say increasing. And you know, many of us will have seen this in our work with students. So this is a screen grab of the analytics screen of an online survey tool I use with students in my course. Uh, midway through a course to get a sort of sense of, you know, how's it going? What could you do to improve? What could we do to improve? Um, and we do this in class, and overwhelmingly, the majority of them use smartphones. If you can't see the numbers, it's about 800 unique visits, 615 of which were from smartphones, right? So these are an ever-present part of students' lives, of many of our lives, uh, and they're quite prepared to use them to support their learning in an academic context. So we've seen and continue to see examples of that scale and pace of change. Moving on to this idea of, of the reach of technology and, and unbundling or disaggregating the, the academic enterprise. Um, as Kelly mentioned, I, I, I teach on this large first year course. Um, tempting as it is, I have resisted the temptation to put any physics into this talk. <laughs> so this will be a physics free zone for the next 50 minutes, apart from maybe this slide. So this is one of a series of over 100 videos freely available on YouTube um, by this very engaging but slightly scary gentleman. <laughs> 
um, who does this wonderful exposition in front of a whiteboard deriving one of the key principles of introductory fluid mechanics, Bernoulli's principle. Now in my course, I want students to appreciate where this comes from. I certainly don't want them to regurgitate or you know, learn by rote how to construct this equation. I really want them to know how to use it to solve problems. That's what the course is all about. But equally, I don't just want to pluck it out of the air and say, ta-da, here's this equation, please use it. I want them to have a feel for where it comes from. Traditionally, this would have been by saying, please read pages 72 to 84 of the textbook. And it's a fairly long, static, involved derivation. And not all of my students will do that. For some of them, this is a more appealing and attractive way to get the kind of appreciation I need them to have. He's pretty engaging. He does a great job of presenting it. It would be a complete waste of my time trying to replicate this performance in a classroom environment. So increasingly, and this is not just restricted to my course in any way, we're seeing the opportunities to supplement or even replace traditional sources of academic content with freely available open materials. And as I say, there's something like 40 20-minute videos uh, that this group produced directly related to the content on my course. If you dig a little bit deeper, um, you begin to see some evidence of this idea of disaggregation or unbundling. Because although all these videos are freely available on, on YouTube, and they're reasonably popular, right? So 72,000 views. I don't know how many decades it would take me to teach 72,000 students about Bernoulli's principle. Um, dig a little bit deeper, and what you find is that the company behind this offers personalized learning solutions for students preparing for standardized tests, like the MCAT tests. So you get the videos for free. Right? And this is something we hear more and more. Content is out there, it's available, and it's much more readily accessible than it has been. What, in this case, for this company is a paid-for service, is the individual feedback, whether it's through a machine or a human being, but it's feedback to the individual about their progress towards some goal that they have set themselves. So it's an example, I think, of this unbundling or disaggregation of previously an enterprise that was provided by a far smaller number of providers, typically higher education institutions, uh, with many, many more um, players coming into the market and sort of identifying bits of the value chain, if you like, of what universities and institutions do uh, to sort of target. So that's reach and unbundling. Um, and finally, disruption. Um, apologies, even the people at the front won't be able to read this graph. <laughs> so um, let me just talk through it. Um, it's a graph with lots of colored bars on it. it there's an organization called Kaggle that solves business challenges using predictive analytics. And a few years ago, they held a three-month competition sponsored by the Hewlett Foundation to develop algorithms that would automatically score the quality of written text, that would automatically grade essays. So this was a three-month challenge. It brought together a number of really established players who had commercial products for many, many years. Uh, they tend to be the green bars to the right of this graph. It also brought together um, groups of graduate students who thought, yeah, let's have a go at this. And one of those graduate students, Vic Parachuri, which is where I actually took this blog post from, formed a team um, with two or three other graduate students, and they entered this competition. And I don't think they won, but I think they came third or second or something like that. Um, and everything on this graph, what you're looking at is a whole range of teams along the x-axis and some measure of accuracy or reliability 
in what they're being asked to do um, using some fairly complicated algorithms, so please don't ask me about it. But the red bar is a group of human beings. Everything to the left of the red bar more accurately, according to some metric, grades textual data than a group of human beings. Now, I, I present this not to try and enter a debate about the merits of automated essay scoring, <laughs> right? It is an incredibly contentious topic. So rather than think about where, when, how, or even if you might want to use this type of technology, it's provided as an illustration that there are things that you can now do with machine learning algorithms that challenge the notion um, that these activities can only be provided by a human being. And again, I think we've all seen examples of that. Many of us work at institutions where faculty will make use of the online quiz tool in the LMS. We can grade students taking that quiz at three in the morning. The LMS will do it, particularly if it's a short answer or a multiple choice or a numerical entry test. That is not something I'm prepared to do, is grade student tests at three in the morning, right? So that's a sort of smaller scale example um, of how we're already seeing this provision of technology to provide feedback, be it formative or summative, to students on their progress towards learning goals. So three quick examples about scale and pace, reach, and disruptive capability or potential or threat, or however you want to frame that, from technology. The, the takeaway, I guess, or the implication is that this is changing pretty much every aspect you can think of, of how, with whom, from where, when, in what order, around so many aspects of life. And learning, be it in an informal context, in a career or professional context, or in a university higher education context, is not excluded. In fact, it's very firmly included. Which brings me to this, this idea of, in this environment where we have technology as a driver, we have all other drivers, many other drivers which I've not discussed, how do we as educators or as people who are supporting educators in their role, how do we acquire, develop, refine the sorts of skills and habits, attitudes, values that we need to be able to thrive in this environment rather than just think that we're being faced by a continually rolling wave of things getting more and more challenging. Uh, I think it is true that the teaching and learning part of a traditional academic role is becoming more challenging. It's certainly becoming more complex. The environment is much more complex now. Uh, and so what I want us to do is just spend a moment thinking about what these parts, these body parts, so this is where the idea of an anatomy comes in. What are the pieces? What are the component parts? And I'd like your input. I have some ideas of what this might be, and again, no peeking ahead if you have the slides. <laughs> right? I will recognize if you use exactly the same words as I did. <laughs> Um, but if you have a web-enabled device, please go to this website, m.socrative.com. We'll work on any, <laughs> most <laughs> devices. <laughs> please don't make me provide IT support for my own talk. Um, m.socrative.com, it should uh, prompt you for a room number, which is UBC1 all lowercase, and if you get to that point, you should see the first question which says, help me understand what your role is. So I want to find out a little bit about the composition of uh, the room. 
And I think if you are having problems, uh, rather than look to the front, turn to your neighbor and uh, just see if they can, uh, they can help you out. M dot Socrative, C S O C R A T I V E dot com, and room UBC one is the room number. And you will need to log on to the Wi Fi first. Okay, we have sixty one people who have. Uh, Navigated, managed it. Okay, so that's how you've responded to the first question. I hope the first question was pretty easy. Right? So, 20% faculty, 40-ish percent learning support with a focus on technology, 70% leadership and administrative role. Sorry if people who voted other thought that was a truncated list. I wanted to keep it to a reasonable number of choices for screen readability. Okay, so that gives us a sense of um, how we're doing. Okay, so when you've entered the first question, ooh, caught out by my own uh, display there, it should advance automatically to the second question where I want you to start thinking about what are some of these skills, component parts, attitudes, values, attributes of an educator. And I'll give you, oh, look at that. Some people have finished already. There are only two questions. So if you think of more of one of these, I did toy with should we have lots of questions to, if people wanted to do one and then another and then another. But if you have multiple ideas or multiple parts, uh, then please put them on separate lines within the same answer choice. <clears throat> And then we'll have a look at some of the, uh, the answers here. And I have to remember to read some of them out. Yes? <laughs> right. Is it signing on to the Wi-Fi? Right. <laughs> Technology. 
So look, what I, what I will do, I want, to, I want to carry on, but I will leave the quiz open so that people who do want to participate can do uh, as they solve their, their technical gremlins. Um, so let's have a look at some answers. This is fantastic. Look at that in the first one. Ah, it was the first one a moment ago. It's been, <laughs> right, I better be quick. Uh, willing, the one that caught my eye that's about to disappear off the bottom of the screen. Willing to risk, adventuresome, open-minded, creative, ability to tune out technology. Interesting. <laughs> Knowledge of pedagogy, technology skills, instructional design, open to new ways of facilitating. Okay, there's tons of good, wow. Someone can type fast. <laughs> Willing to change practice to reflect current research, understanding empathy, recognize challenges students face, and be partners in supporting them. Commitment, creativity, technology as a tool, not as a driver. Lifelong learner, flexibility, adaptability, content expert. Okay, so I could spend the remainder of the talk just reading out your comments. Um, what I will do is, with this system, and if any of you haven't used it before, it's called Socrative, um, you can register for a free account. I think the free accounts now limit the number of participants you can have in any one session. Not quite sure. I signed up some time ago, which is why mine can accommodate 100 plus um, users in the same session. Um, I'm able to download a response file and I'm happy to append that onto the slides or put it up in the same place or find some way of sharing it with, uh, with people. And the folks who are doing graphic facilitation are madly scribbling <laughs> at the moment. So this is wonderful. Thank you for, uh, for doing that. And apologies if you did have technical issues, but I've left the, uh, the quiz open. Uh, and will do at least until the end of the talk. So if you want to participate, please, uh, please persevere. So I saw, even in the brief scan there, there are a lot of similar themes and ideas to some of the areas that uh, I had identified previously. So these are my six body parts. And again, I'll, I'll read them out for those at the back who maybe can't have access to a clear view of these. Um, but a caveat, they might not be complete, they might not be all equally appropriate within all disciplines, but I think they're a starting point for a conversation about this. And from a quick scan of what you collectively submitted, there's some good overlap and, and resonance there. So, uh, in no particular order, we have teacher for learning, an understanding of how students learn and or how learning takes place and the ability to design effective instructional activities to support that. So that taps into the idea of what was on the previous slide from one of you about an awareness of instructional design and an awareness of uh, pedagogy and how people learn. I had scholar as well, an awareness and appreciation of effective, research-based, discipline-appropriate pedagogical strategies. So what are the pedagogies that have traction and currency within your discipline? And how has that value and traction been established? Possibly through uh, an evidence base in, uh, in research to evaluate the effectiveness. I have technologist up there. Um, I agree technology is a tool, not as a driver to a certain extent, but I think it is almost impossible to think about designing a learning experience for students in this day and age that doesn't include some aspect of technology either in the delivery of the course material, the way the interactions are set up, or the assessment activities. I have curator. 
down there. And this goes back to that point I was making about the, the bright space guy. Um, there are valuable open educational materials and content that I think many faculty members still have too much of the not invented here approach, right? No one can do the exposition of Bernoulli's equation as well as I can. Well, actually, they probably can. He does a pretty good job, and so do many, many others. So I think a curator of existing resources as well as a producer of your own. Um, probably the two most important ones are the ones that remain, a collaborator. Now, in putting up these body parts, I'm not trying to suggest that every faculty member or every academic has to be an expert in all of these. It's simply not going to happen. You may all be able to think of colleagues that actually are experts in many, if not all, of these. But I would say these will be the exception rather than the norm. So collaboration becomes really, really important because if you're not the expert in instructional design, you'd better have an attitude and an openness to collaborate with people who are. And increasingly, we're seeing more and more, particularly large courses, courses taught in early years, courses taught to large number of students, even MOOCs, involve a team of people in the design, development, delivery, and evaluation that collectively bring this composite skill set without necessarily the requirement for one person to possess all of these at a very, very high level. So I think collaborator is really important. And the last one is experimenter, a willingness to try things. Because if we are in an environment where things are changing, we'll keep changing. There has to be an openness to try new approaches, to experiment. You know, many of these, are, the, the, these categories or parts overlap. They're not distinct. Um, but I think an openness towards experimentation or a willingness to collaborate with those for whom this is a priority, those engaged in discipline-based educational research or evaluation, um, I think this is a really important part of the composite picture. So what I want to do for the remainder of the talk is focus on some work that I've been doing in the last few years. Kelly alluded to it in the introduction in terms of having students generate original content and assessment activities within the context of a large course. Um, and I guess if I had to pick one of these component parts, I'd pick Experimenter because that was very much, that, that really sort of exemplifies this because this was very much the approach through which we incorporated this into our courses. It was an experiment. We wanted to see if it would work. We wanted to see if we could find a way to engage students deeply with material to produce authentic assessment content and to have a degree of control and flexibility over a resource to support their own learning. So it started as an experiment. And what I'm going to show you is, is a number of experiments or studies spanning uh, the last four or five years in this area. So what I'll talk about is centered around uh, an online tool that's freely available. It's hosted in New Zealand. Uh, it's called Peerwise. Without wanting to take another five minutes to use the technology, could I just have a low-tech show of hands? Who has heard of Peerwise before? A few. Anyone used it before? OK, a fewer few. Um, what this system basically provides is a course-based web repository of multiple choice questions created by, answered by, discussed, and curated by a group of students. In, in one fairly long sentence, that's what it does. Um, in terms of uptake, it was developed in around 2007, 2008. 
um, by a computer scientist at the University of Auckland, Paul Denny. It's now used at something like 350 institutions. Students have authored over one million questions, and there's well over 20 million answers. In fact, I don't know what the current numbers are. These are probably 18 months out of date. And if you can see the curves at the bottom that show uh, answers and questions as a function of time, this is a steeply increasing, uh, increasing graph. So it's fairly widely used at many institutions. I, so Paul Denny, the, the originator, sent me this, uh, this map, and I thought, there's something really strange about this map. Well, of course, it has New Zealand right in the center of the map, <laughs> which for us is not a usual way that we... Uh, so it's a different way of looking at the world. I'm surprised he didn't flip it upside down as well, just to be. So it's fairly widely used. The basic idea is you leverage student energy and creativity that so often in many courses is left latent because you know, they do the assessments we say in the order that we prescribe them. And there's little flexibility or creativity. So you find a way of leveraging that, particularly in large class settings, though people have used this system with classes of 20. Um, it exploits student familiarity with social software, social media. 10 years ago, we might have called this Web 2.0 software. The idea that it's not simply delivery of content, but there are activities in creating, remixing, blending, developing content uh, through web tools or web interfaces. And also this idea of student ownership. It gives them, so the LMS course space is very much the institutional controlled view of the course. It's what we provide for students in a certain order. This space, certainly the way many people have implemented it, including us, this is a student space. It's you know, we're, we're in, the, in the implementations we've used, we're relatively hands-off in terms of what we do in this space. We might lurk, right? We might peer over their shoulders. We might even, I've heard of people assuming identities as fake students just to see what's going on. But this is not an institutionally controlled learning space. This is something that the students take a sense of ownership and responsibility in developing. And so the workflow um, from a student's perspective is they are generally set a task of creating questions in this environment. They have to create questions. It's a rich text editor. They can put video, images, links, whatever. Uh, they have to provide answer choices. It is limited to multiple choice questions. We're working on other projects that embody the same kind of idea with open text comments rather than you know, A is right and B is wrong and everything else is wrong. They have to provide an explanation for why A is right and B, C, D, and E are wrong. They cannot submit the question without that. So they have to provide some argument or justification as to why the answer is what they've chosen it to be. And then they submit it into the repository and it becomes available for other students to answer to comment on, to discuss, to message or like or thumbs up, right? All the kind of Reddit social software functionality that students are very, very familiar with. So it becomes this kind of dynamic, active learning space. When you log in as a student, it looks a bit like, well, there are aspects of it that look like Facebook. You get three new notifications. So-and-so has commented on your post. There's an unresolved question about one of your answers. 17 people have been discussing this question you authored last week. So it gives some user-facing analytics to the students to promote engagement and motivation. So a couple of other features. There are these rich text discussions. There are keywords, so you can tag um, questions. You can either prescribe your own taxonomy as an instructor, or you can let students invent their own keywords. Um, the first time I used it, teaching 
predominantly 18, 19 year old physics students. We had tags like beer and superheroes and things like that, as well as those actually relating to the content on the course. And, and students who answer questions can rate the difficulty and the quality on this sort of fairly coarse scale. It also has badges built into it as achievements for motivating students. And Paul Denny, the author, has done a really neat A-B testing study where uh, he had a group of students for whom badging was turned on and a group of students for whom badging was turned off and controlled for different levels of initial ability and found that the presence of badging increases persistence and motivation and activity within the, uh, within the platform. Uh, there's a point system as well, and there are things like leaderboards. These sorts of things motivate some students. They're not necessarily the, uh, the sort of key motivator for many students. Many will not care if they get a blue ribbon for being in the top five, but some will. And the instructor has the capability to turn some of these off as, uh, as they would like when they set the course up. So, um, just some brief description of typically how this has been implemented. So this is from my, my physics course that I taught at UBC. Um, the sections within the semester I teach, three sections, 800 students, we typically set a couple of these assessment activities during the semester. So they are part of the continuous assessment mark that the students get for the course. And the way we award the credit is to say there are minimum participation requirements that you must meet. And typically these are something like, you know, for an assessment that takes a few hours, one week, as well as them doing lectures and tutorials and labs, it would be something like create one question, answer five from other people, rate and comment on three others, right? So the idea, we're, we're asking students to write original material, and as you'll see on the next slide, the way we implemented it is we're asking them to write questions about things they don't understand. Now this is a demanding task, as any of you know when you come to try and set an assessment or an exam paper that tries to test skills higher than rote memorization or remembering or regurgitation. So we're setting a, a cognitively difficult task for, in this implementation, novice first year undergraduates. Uh, and typically, these two peer-wise assessments would contribute something like 5% of the overall course mark, right? There's no sort of fixed rules about how much credit needs to be awarded for each assessment, though as you might imagine, if it's an optional activity, engagement and participation is somewhat lower, dramatically lower, and you only get a certain type of students participating. Right? So that's, they're the students who would do anything you ask of them anyway. So that's typically how it's, it's been implemented. A less typical implementation, at least a, a few years ago when we first tried it, was this idea of providing extensive scaffolding activities to support students in what was a cognitively challenging task. Please write an original question about a topic you don't understand. So, the first time we introduced this, I remember speaking with my colleagues who were teaching other sections and said, I need 120 minutes of tutorial time to do this, to do this properly. Because we'd stepped out a scaffolded process that will walk students through, you know, how do you know what you don't know? How do you try and go through the creative process of building a multiple choice question about that that makes it engaging, answerable, you know, all these. How do you come up with plausible alternatives that are different to none of the above, right? This is a difficult task. And my colleagues are saying, 120, that's two tutorials, right? When, where, and when are we going to, and I'm sure many of you have heard this, cover all the content? Anyway, we got 120 minutes to do this in tutorials. And so we really built this extensive scaffolding process. And again, if anybody's interested in seeing the scaffolding 
materials, they're all available online through one of the links later in the course. In, in the course, sorry. <laughs> later in the lecture, I will give you the reading list and homework. Um, so we spent a lot of time on this. We also, I didn't just ask for 120 minutes, I came back to it in subsequent tutorials. Right, so they'd gone through the process once. We had a debrief, what did you learn? Here are good examples, here are not so good examples. So we brought it back and we really wove it into the course, the class face-to-face -face time and the course assessments. Um, and very quickly, I'm gonna go through some results that, that highlight three key areas that you might be wondering, how does this work with students? Students' engagement, so how do they actually use the system? What effect, if any, does it have on learning? And what kind of questions do novice students write about things they don't understand? So quickly going through those. In terms of engagement, you'll recall that a couple of slides ago I said typically you would set minimum participation requirements. Write one question, answer five, rate and comment on three others. And the reason why we stress those three components is they're all different parts of the learning process, right? So writing your own questions is, is one learning activity. Considering and answering the questions of others is another. And discussing and commenting and argue, you know, arguing in a positive sense the, the, the answers and, and, and the comments of other students is another valuable activity, even in a physics course. People need to be able to, uh, to talk. Typically, we saw engagement far above the minimum participation requirements. So these columns here are multipliers. These are multipliers above the minimum participation requirements that we saw in two activities, peerwise one, peerwise two, within the same course. So question multipliers, on average, students wrote 1.7 questions when they only needed to get the participation marks to write one question. They answered 17 questions on average when to get the participation marks they only needed to answer five and they commented on about seven and a half questions. And this is very typical for other implementations as well. There's a slide in the talk that I won't discuss in great detail that's taken from a multi-course, multi-institution study where everybody implemented it in slightly different ways, in different courses, different subjects, different institutions. And consistently, there's this multiplier factor where students participate beyond the minimum requirements with the largest multiplying factors in the easier of the three activities. In other words, they didn't generally write 20 questions when they only had to write one, because that's a really hard thing to do particularly if you're asking them to write high quality questions. So the engagement was high, and it was high across very different course, institution, and subject contexts. Um, I wanted to show at least one example of something that students produce, and those of you near the front or near a screen will see this. This is a screen grab of a question that um, a student authored. Um, first of all, I just love the diagram. Right? Whenever I look at the diagram, it just makes me smile. It's James Bond and a baddie. Um, and you know, there's a sort of context wrapped around this. The point of showing it is not, because, not just because it's an amusing context and diagram, but this provided us as instructors with a real insight into how peer learning happens in this course. Because when this question was created, the original author got the answer wrong. They thought the answer was D. And what they'd done, and again, I'll spare you the physics lecture about coefficients of friction, but they'd use the wrong coefficient of friction, right? Static, not kinetic. And I saw this because I was, you know, it was one evening I was lurking, looking at seeing how students were engaging with this experiment we were doing with them. And, um, I emailed my, my co-instructor and said, this is terrible, there's wrong stuff in the questions. The students are getting the answers wrong. And to his credit, he talked me down from wading in and said, just step back, just wait and see what happens. 
Next morning, I got up and obsessively went to have a look at the question thread again. And within two hours, someone had pointed out that the original author, and this was all documented in discussions, they got the question wrong. And then what unfolded over the next 90 minutes was the two discussants identifying what the problem was. Oh, yeah, you're right. I used this one instead of this one. And they collaborated on a new question. Right? So this question was junk because it was wrong, and a new question was submitted in its place. What you're looking at is the new question. And the postscript to the story is, and maybe you can see this if you've got the screen in front of you, the author's original answer turned out to be the most frequently chosen response by the hundred and some students who later went on to answer this question. So this student was under the same alternate conception about how this particular situation in, in kinematics works. Um, and with the collaborative input from a peer, this was diagnosed, corrected, and represented back to the, uh, to the rest of the students. So it was just a lovely little case study of how this works in practice. Uh, and it still makes me smile as, uh, as a diagram. Here's another example. This is from, so that was from the Edinburgh course that I taught previously. This is from a UBC course. This course I teach is full of uh, 1,700 non-majors in physics who don't want to be there. Right? That's a slight caricature, but by and large, they are doing it to fulfill degree requirements, credit requirements in physics, or because they desperately want to get into med school. There are none there who aspire to be future physicists. And so, you know, diverse motivations for taking the course. Even with this population of students, we see really deep engagement. This is a question that one of the UBC students produces. Again, there's great answers here. Every answer is plausible. They all embody known alternate conceptions or known mistakes that students will make. And you see that with the, the distribution of answers being the way, the way it is. And I won't read out the discussions because unless you've got the screen in front of you, you really can't read it. But there were something like 90 comments attached to this sailboat question. Um, really rich discussion of things I'd been saying for years in front of these classes. Like, um, don't put the numbers in first. Work the problem through algebraically. I can't tell you how many times I've said that to students over my teaching career. And yet, here it is, it's a student who says, back in high school, I would always try plugging in values first and then solving, but this often leads to many mistakes. Doing the algebra first and canceling stuff out always helps a lot, eh? So, <laughs> that's how we know that's not the Edinburgh data set. Um, Another stuff there at the bottom, you know, you deserve a big fat star. So there's a lot of what some of my colleagues may feel uncomfortable about non-academic language and non-academic interaction. I'm fine with that. I really am. There's clear evidence that students are really deeply engaged and discussing uh, these materials. I'm nearly out of time. So what I'm going to do is... I'll leave you to have a look at the data on evidence of benefit for learning in your own time. The sort of 30 second story is that, maybe I'll just show the slides. Um, the 30 second story is that across five different course contexts in three disciplines at uh, three institutions, we saw higher achievement as measured by end of course exam results from students who had used the system more, irrespective of the ability of those students coming into the course. So it was not a case of just the really smart students in the class using the system more because they would always make more use of all resources. We saw this as a correlation with learning, and I want to stress this is correlation and I'm making no claims for causation. Uh, a correlation with end of course learning activity um, across all ability ranges within uh, 
the students in various courses at different institutions. In other words, we think it's an activity that benefits all students. It may benefit them for different reasons. So the top students might get the benefit principally from writing really good questions, whereas the lower ability students might get more of the benefit from kind of just doing more, a bit of a time on task argument. But um, we see benefits across a whole range of students and courses. I want to finish just in the last couple of minutes with, with some insights we got about question quality, because what my colleagues often said to me when we said we were trying this experiment is, oh, they'll just write rubbish, right? It will be wrong, it will be stupid, it won't be like academically appropriate. So we set out to try and evaluate a representative fraction of the questions from certain course repositories to assess the quality of the question and the quality of the explanation offered by the authors of the question. So for the quality of the question, we mapped the question quality onto the levels in the cognitive domain of Bloom's taxonomy. We had three raters doing this. We did the usual checks and balances to make sure we had good inter-rater reliability. Uh, and then we set them loose and we said, please evaluate 600 questions from these two course repositories, um, which they did. And this is the distribution of questions from these two courses in the taxonomy categories uh, of Bloom, starting from you know, low level remembering at number one, going all the way up to synthesis. Uh, at the, the higher orders. In subsequent analyses, we, we kind of collapsed four, five, and six together because we get in these endless arguments of was it analysis, evaluation, synthesis, or all three? And often, questions at that level really were all three. So it didn't really matter. We just put them in a composite category because as sure as anything, they weren't remembering or factual recall. So you know, we found pretty good evidence of students producing very high quality questions. Some of these were astonishing. They really were. They were so good that, again, the experimenter in me had an idea. And I reformatted some of these questions, and I tidied them up for language. But I kept the essence of the questions the same. And I just happened to leave some of them on the tables in the coffee room uh, in our department and said, some of these are written by students. Can you work out which ones? <laughs> and um, well, first of all, they were all written by students. Uh, but then we put some in that were past exam papers. And the bottom line was a you know, non-representative sample of about 10 of my colleagues. They couldn't tell which was which. Students were producing questions that were essentially indistinguishable from uh, what people had produced in, in support of summative assessments idea for how to set exams in the future. Um, the other thing we did was we ranked the explanation quality, and there's not a good sort of well-established taxonomy for this. So we worked and developed our own that basically went from missing, inadequate, minimal, right, just about OK, to good, to excellent. So a, a five-point scale. And we, the, the way we caricatured the excellent explanations is I will brag about you and put your slides in my talk, right? So that's, you know, and there really were plenty of examples of, uh, of those. And this is an example from the UBC class of how the distribution of explanations changed over time, right? So this is what we started with in blue in about week four. You know, most of them were minimal, but it was suspiciously normally distributed, right? So there was pretty much some across the board. In the second iteration, after we'd brought it back into the tutorial sessions and workshopped some of the ideas about what makes a good question and a good explanation, we got the graph on the, uh, the right-hand side, a real shift towards better quality explanations. So this, and this is a significant shift at like the 1% level. So we're seeing pretty clear evidence of students getting better at doing this throughout, uh, throughout a course. Um, some results, I've, I've covered many of these, but the bottom line, the sort of takeaway is from our experiments, provided students have the right scaffolding, 
they are capable of producing very high quality assessment questions that can be used not only as an instructional resource to benefit their own understanding during the course, but can be used for summative evaluation of the students in the course, and you can feed forward as a repository for the next year of students to use for other learning activities. And just a brief comparison with the literature, we think one of the main reasons for this is because of this extensive scaffolding process. It's because we managed to create this 120 minutes at the start of the course to introduce the idea, the concept, and let students, in groups first of all, practice some of these skills. Um, other research studies have found without this scaffolding, you do tend to get predominantly low-level questions. And in looking at some of the literature for this, in um, a biology education journal, they identified 10,000 multiple choice questions submitted by 50 instructors in the United States and found 93% of them were in the lowest two levels of Bloom's taxonomy. So these are instructor contributed questions that according to their evaluation were way, way down in terms of the skills that they were requiring of students to, uh, to actually answer them. So we were pretty pleased with uh, what students have uh, been able to, uh, to produce. If any of you are familiar with any or all of these books, you will have in your idea, I would imagine, a pretty strong understanding of why something like this might work. It gives students ownership over parts of their learning in a way that they don't normally get in higher education. It taps into kind of activating prior knowledge. It works on motivation and classroom climate, elements of the seven principles of how learning works. And many of you will recognize it as basically an instance of reciprocal teaching, which according to John Hattie's analysis of you know, gazillion research studies, this meta-analysis looking at instructional effects or instructional techniques that are known to work, reciprocal teaching is one of the ones that has one of the largest effect sizes, something like 0.8, in terms of its potential to, uh, to improve student learning. So I think there's good grounding in the literature and in uh, research that points to why this will, if implemented appropriately with students, uh, contribute towards their learning. So I know I've gone slightly over time and eaten into your coffee and networking break, so apologies for that. I want to try and bring it back to this idea of the anatomy of a 21st century educator. I, I said just before I introduced the peerwise stuff that I think, you know, I cast it as experimenter, but really I think it touches on all of these, uh, all of these elements. And if we have a few minutes for, for questions, happy to take questions or comments or anything people might want to contribute. So thank you. Thank you.